Good morning, Berkeley First. My name is Kyle Denzler, and whether you're joining us in person or online, it is so good to be together. If you're a Republican or a Democrat, black or white, Asian or Hispanic, rich or poor, LGBTQ plus or straight, a hunter or a vegan, you are welcome here. We exist to gather, nurture, and equip disciples of Jesus Christ for ministry and mission into the world. If you are seated on the center aisle here, please fill out that red sign-in pad, pass it down your row, and when it goes all the way to the wall, please pass it back open and you can learn the names of those who are sitting near you. We are currently collecting supplies now through October 16th, gathering in peanut butter, jelly, yakisoba meals, and other non-perishable lunch items to be able to assemble lunch bags for our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness. Um, my husband and I cleaned out the peanut butter from the Madison Heights Kroger, so don't look there. Um, but if you do want to donate, you can bring in those supplies anytime that you're in here at the church. We have a couple of fun events coming up in October. And the first one is Storytellers, which is a night of music, stories, songs, and inspiration from four musicians. That's happening October 21st from 7 to 8.30 p.m. and will be right here in the Berkeley First Sanctuary. My husband and I attended the first uh, iteration of this event, and it was a night that was just really good for the soul. So please come and connect to these amazing individuals through their stories. And on Sunday, October 30th, stick around after service from 11.30 to 1 p.m. We're going to do pumpkins and pizza. And no, the pumpkins won't be on the pizza, um, but you can bring your own pumpkin to carve and then leave the mess here with us. Carving tools and pizza, again, sans pumpkin, will be provided. So yes, you do have to bring your own pumpkin if you want to participate in that event. Okay, so if you didn't hear that, Julie said she has about 20 to 25 pie pumpkins for the little ones if needed. Oh, thanks, Josh. <laughs> After worship today, everyone is invited to join a time for prayer as we lift up the joys and concerns for our families, the church, and the world. We'll be in the parlor just down the hall at 1120, or you can also join via Zoom, and that Zoom link is in the Friday email update. You can also visit berkeleyfirst.org for more information about groups, events, and activities. And also on the website is a giving link, so you can set up one-time or recurring financial gifts to support our shared work together. God is up to good things here, and as we turn our hearts to worship, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today we turn our hearts to your words this morning. Let us hear and see you in the songs and in the scripture and in the speaking. Let our hearts reach out to our neighbors, both around the corner and around the world. We ask special prayer this morning for those in Florida and the Carolinas as they put their lives back together in the wake of the hurricane. We ask for protection and strength for our sisters in Iran as they fight against that oppressive regime. And Lord, we thank you this morning for this community of faith and for your son who makes it possible. In his awesome name we pray. Amen. I can see the clouds rolling I can feel the world as they try to shake me You will not be moved My feet are on the rock around the rock when I feel my hope about to break I will cling to your unchanging grace let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain my feet around the rock Ooh. I can see the morning joy on the horizon you won't hold me now i stand on solid ground Right. 
rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands.
Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Thank you, Kyle. Our God is a God of reconciliation. A God who does not leave broken things as they are, but who wades into the muck and mire of our fallen human existence to redeem, restore, and reconcile. Would you pray with me? God, as we wrap up this three-week series on racial reconciliation, give us hearts that beat in sync with yours. Empower us to listen, to uphold, and to act with justice, compassion, and love toward one another. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In her book, Be the Bridge, which has offered a framework for this series, Latasha Morrison writes that the aim of reconciliation is the restoration of relationships. She goes on to clarify, I don't just mean individual relationships. I also mean healing of communal relationships and societal connections. Since reconciliation involves restoring broken relationships, some would argue that it's impossible to bring about reconciliation if there never was a relationship to begin with. But the reality is, in differing degrees, we are all connected with one another and with God's original intent from the beginning. In God's kingdom, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, it's true that each of us should be in the business of cultivating new relationships with one another, even in the places where no current relationship exists to be restored, God's original intent is still present. Reconciliation anchors us in that reality. And just as racism is both an individual and collective issue, so reconciliation needs to be both individual and collective. Reconciliation involves facing reality, both of the past and the present. We could talk about Tulsa, Selma, and Montgomery, but let's look a little closer to home. Right here in Berkeley, Michigan, in 1924, Reverend Oren Van Loon, pastor of Berkeley Community Church, just a couple blocks from here, preached a sermon condemning the Ku Klux Klan's burning of crosses. He was then abducted and branded with the letters KKK burned onto his upper back. When the St. John Woods neighborhood was developed in the 1930s, the neighborhood that includes this church building and the house right behind it where I live, which was built as the pastor's house, deed restrictions stated that the property, and I quote, could not be occupied by any person or persons other than members of the Caucasian race. This church was built on that land. This church was built with those deed restrictions in place. Enforcement of these blatantly racist and exclusionary deed restrictions was thankfully struck down by the Supreme Court in Shelley v. Kramer in 1948. We've got a couple of attorneys who I know would appreciate the specific citation of the case law. But many still exist on the books. A resident of our neighborhood association found out that those racist and exclusionary words, though unenforced, were still in the official record book and took it upon himself to get the signatures needed by residents to have it removed. Just last year, our church board of trustees under the leadership of John Smaga, were made aware of this work and signed off on removing that language and replacing it with language stating that all are welcome in the St. John Woods subdivision. 
What actual difference does that make? Probably not much. But it is a step in the right direction to understand our history and our present reality and to work towards reconciliation. If some of these historic realities are new to you, I encourage you to visit a library or hop onto some reputable websites and educate yourself. Learn about how blacks were largely excluded from participating in the benefits of the GI Bill in post-World War II America, and how as a result, a huge segment of society was excluded from the creation of the middle class as we know it today. Learn about the suppression of black excellence and business when the vibrant neighborhood of Black Bottom in Detroit with hundreds of black-owned businesses and tens of thousands of residents was raised, replaced with a largely white residential district, and in 1964, the most useless stretch of highway in America, I-375. A popular phrase spoken by blacks at the time lamenting this reality in Detroit was, Urban renewal means Negro removal. Think about what gentrification means for certain neighborhoods, not just historically, but today. In his book, Holding Up Your Corner, F. Willis Johnson writes, We can acknowledge that we are all broken persons and that the reconciliation work needs to be done within. We need to reconcile with who we are and with a God that tells us who we ought to be. In that process of reconciliation, we can begin to build relationships with those we have othered. We'll get to our scripture passage from 2 Corinthians in a moment, but I first want to look at another passage from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is delivering the famed Sermon on the Mount. And in talking about our relationships with God and with one another, he says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. In other words, don't presume to worship God when there's blood on your hands or anger in your heart. Don't think you can be in right relationship with God without seeking to be in right relationship with the people around you. Our relationships with each other impact our relationship with God. James writes, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's image. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And in 1 John 4, we read that whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. We cannot be exclusivist, judgmental, or racist toward others and expect God to be inclusive, loving, and gracious toward us. Reconciliation is God's work, but it's also our work. It's the work of God in and through us. It's other people's work too. But that does not give us permission to shirk our God-given responsibility to do what we can, where we can, as often as we can, to take steps forward. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. Through this lens of racial reconciliation. Paul writes, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. That is, we don't see people as the world sees them. We see people as God sees them, as beloved, as one, as us. With all of our social labels and hierarchies surrendering to the greatness of God in Jesus Christ. 
Paul goes on to say that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. The new creation is not only a matter of individual transformation, though that's certainly important. It's a matter of God's unfolding work in all the world and of our participation in it. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation, God's plans, God's purposes are reality. When you put your trust in Jesus, you inherit all of God's blessings, not just for some future time, but right then and there. You are grafted into God's family tree, adopted into the family with all the rights and responsibilities of a child of God. All this is God's gift. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Think about the order of events here in that sentence. And it's clear that God is the primary actor. God is the main character. God sent Jesus. God reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, but making a way for the restoration of relationship. But it didn't stop there. After reconciling us, God then called us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. When God's new creation takes root in your heart, your mind, your life, it should impact how you relate to the wider world. Let others know that they too can be reconciled and restored into right relationship with God and with one another. God is going to do God's part. You don't have to worry about that. But each of us has to do our part as well. Now, whether we're talking about the problem of racism in America or about any other need for human reconciliation, whether it's the broken relationship between a husband and wife, a parent and their child, a boss and a co-worker, it's important to acknowledge that reconciliation is a process. It doesn't happen all at once. And it does involve restitution or reparation, a righting of the wrong that has been done. Latasha Morrison offers a great example of this in her book, Be the Bridge. Say I own a gift shop, she writes, and business is so good that I hire an additional employee to assist me. My new employee, Scott, and I agree that I will pay him $500 a week. Scott and I work alongside each other for several weeks, and everything appears to be going well. Then one day, Scott pulls me aside and says, Hey, you agreed to pay me $500 a week, but you've been paying me only $300 a week. I might feel horrible because the discrepancy was caused by a clerical oversight, and though it wasn't my fault, I need to make it right. I acknowledge my mistake and ask for Scott's forgiveness, which he graciously gives me. I promise that from now on, I will always pay him the correct amount. Have I made things right? Have I reconciled? No. At least not yet. If you were Scott, you would say, and rightly so, that things aren't fully reconciled until I pay the missing $200 from his past week's work. Again, there's God's part, and there's our part. From a God perspective, will God forgive you every single time you come and ask him? Yes. Does God appreciate not having to do that every 37 seconds? <laughs> also yes. If there's been severe harm in a relationship, it takes time to build back trust and credibility, especially when there's been severe harm over the course of generations. There has to be some righting of wrongs and positive momentum moving forward. 
From a God perspective, the righting of wrongs for all people and all time was accomplished by Jesus. He did for us individually and collectively what we could never do on our own to make reconciliation possible between us and God and between us and one another. Yet we get to be part of that positive momentum going forward. We have to do our part. Paul writes, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. From a God perspective, Jesus provided more than the 200 do from past week's work. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin, what we deserve for our unjust actions, is death. That's what we've earned. But Jesus took that on himself, not just for one of us, but for all of us, to make reconciliation possible. Be reconciled to God. But then we also have to do our part to be reconciled with one another as individuals and as a society. Don't think you can be in right relationship with God without being in right relationship with those around you. Sometimes it's not possible to be in right relationship with those around you. A relationship goes both ways. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Not peace, though, at the absence of justice. We need to know our history. We need to hope and work for a better future. And we need to anchor ourselves in this present moment where God has planted us to continue God's good work of reconciliation in our corner. As Thomas Merton pointed out, we are already one. But we imagine that we are not. And what we have to recover is our original unity. What we have to be is what we are. God's new creation is already here. How different would the world be if we as church started living it out more fully? As we prepare to approach God's family table, would you pray with me? I'll open us up and then I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. The words will be up on the screen when the time comes. Good and loving God, thank you for making a way for reconciliation when it seemed like there was no way. Thank you for taking on yourself the weight of our sin and for dying in our place. Thank you for committing to us the ministry of reconciliation, for doing your part and for inviting us to do ours as well. Work in us and through us, God, to bring about your new creation. Empower us to live as though unity were already reality, to listen and learn from one another's experiences, and to set our children and grandchildren up in the faith and in the world so that they don't have to repeat the same mistakes, but can make new ones all their own. God, we pray for a more just, less racist, more reconciled world. Give us the grace to work for what we and you desire. Take the elements that we are about to share in God and make them more than a wafer and a little cup of juice. May they be for us, the body and blood of Jesus, as we share together at your family table. That we might be for the world, the body of Christ, reconciled through his loving sacrifice and sent forth to be about your work of reconciliation. As Jesus taught us, so now we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The table is prepared. Absolutely all are welcome. As the band begins to play the first song, we invite you to come forward down the center aisle, receive the elements, return to your seats by the side aisle, and after that first song, we all will share in communion together. If you're worshiping with us online, go ahead and get something to eat and something to drink so that you too can commune with us at God's family table. Come forward as you feel led. Body and blood of Christ for you. The body and blood of Christ.
the night that Jesus gave himself up for us to make reconciliation possible, he took bread and having blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. Burnt. There you go. And said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. When supper was over, Jesus took the cup and having blessed it, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. Let us stand together and sing of God's goodness.
We've got one more song to join in together, but before we do that, I have a special announcement about worship leadership here at Berkeley First and with our multi-site ministries. After nearly six years of leadership among us, Chris Freeman is in the process of discerning what God has in store for him next. Chris will continue to serve as director of multi-site worship through Christmas, and then along with his wife, Alicia, Chris will be taking a year-long sabbatical in the Carolinas before figuring out what the next chapter of their life looks like. We celebrate all of Chris's achievements among us, but most of all, we are grateful for his heart, his inclusiveness, and the unique perspective Chris has brought to the table. This move comes at Chris's request, and while we will miss him dearly, we honor his process of discernment about where God is leading him. Berkeley First and Tapestry, the new online campus we are preparing to launch, our leader full, and we will not be without leadership for this most important area of ministry. Brian White, who is already on staff part-time as Berkeley Music Coordinator, will be stepping into the full-time role of Director of Multi-Site Worship, effective January 1st, 2023. His wife, Julie, just whispered, smile. A talented musician in his own right, Brian has shown himself to be a team player, a humble leader, and a dedicated servant of God. Along with his wife, Julie, this is more than a job for Brian. It is a calling, a ministry, and a family endeavor. Brian brings a community-mindedness to all that he does. He has already shown great leadership here with the Sunday morning worship experience and in the development of tapestry. Brian's creativity is evident around the high holy days of Christmas and Easter, as well as in events such as storytellers. His work ethic and all-hands-on-deck mentality has played a significant role in virtually every event Berkeley First has hosted in the last five years. As we look to all that God has in store, I am both grateful and excited. I am grateful that our paths have crossed with the likes of Chris Freeman, who somebody said earlier uh, has big shoes to fill, except he doesn't wear shoes. I'm grateful that Brian, Chris, and their families continue to say yes to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I'm excited that we have three months to transition well Lord knows that the Big C Church as a whole does not necessarily have a history of great leadership transitions, and we have a chance to show the world what a good church leadership transition looks like. I'm excited for that. Excited that over these next three months, Chris will be coaching Brian on all the various technological and relational aspects of this crucial role, but most of all, I'm excited for what God has in store. God is up to good things. We'll have a chance to have an official celebration together in December before Chris departs and Brian steps into that new full-time role. But for now, go ahead and let's give God a hand. And then let us join together in one more song as our work of ministry continues. Yeah. 
I didn't give them a heads up on this, but both Brian and Chris are going to hang out down here after the service. If you would like to harass Chris or congratulate Brian, please come forward and do so at your leisure. In about 20 minutes, anyone who wants to join in a time for prayer will be in the social hall just down the hall, or sorry, the parlor just down the hall. And as you go from this place, having been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, go as agents of God's reconciliation in the world. Go in peace.